Welcome back, friends. This is Dr. Ruben Inc. Today, we'll talk about cerebrovascular anatomy and vascular imaging. This video is rated MS for medical student due to basic concepts, clear language, and case-based examples. Medical student participation is advised. I have no relevant conflicts to disclose except to say that the case presented here was modified for teaching purposes. Meet Mr. S.E. He's an 83-year-old man with multiple vascular risk factors, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. He suddenly develops disorientation, right-sided visual disturbance, and minor right-sided weakness. Because of his disorientation, some of the history was obtained from the family. He was trying to use his old phone at the time and couldn't quite figure out how to unlock it, something he does without issue several times a day. Family denied him having recent illness or prior thromboembolism. On arrival to the emergency department, he's awake, alert, and oriented to self in place, but not time. He has mild word-finding difficulties and makes paraphasic errors. He called my pen a den. But his repetition was perfectly preserved, and he was able to say no ifs, ands, or buts. He has an obvious, complete right homonymous hemianopia, field cut. There's no weakness on my examination. In this talk, we'll focus on localization and not on pathology. So let me ask you this. Assuming these symptoms are caused by a vascular lesion, what vascular territory is likely affected? Give the answer to yourself and we'll revisit at the end. That reminds me, we have to review some vascular anatomy. Pretend this patient is looking directly at you. Patient's left is on your right. You can see the arch of the aorta at the bottom, giving rise to anterior and posterior circulation vessels. Common carotid arteries typically arise from the brachiocephalic trunk on the right and aortic arch itself on the left. Common carotids bifurcate into external carotids with branches in the neck and internal carotids that ascend to the brain. Subclavian arteries give rise to the vertebral arteries which supply the posterior circulation. So far so good? Great. Now let's take a look at the intracranial vasculature and the circle of Willis. The two vertebral arteries we spoke about are visible here, together with an important perforator called the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or pica. Vertebrals then join together to form the basilar artery, with major branches including anterior inferior cerebellar artery, or ICA, and superior cerebellar artery, or SCA. At its tip, the basilar artery bifurcates into posterior cerebral arteries. It sort of looks like a palm tree. The PCAs of the posterior circulation are connected to the ICAs of the anterior circulation by the posterior communicating artery. Intracranial internal carotid arteries then bifurcate into middle cerebral arteries and anterior cerebral arteries. And the ACAs are then connected by the anterior communicating artery. And the circle of Willis is complete. By the way, there's quite a bit of variability in the vasculature. So if you're watching this talk with two other people, turn to your right. Now turn to your left. Statistically, one of you has a complete circle of Willis. Speaking of the circle of Willis, time to identify blood vessels in the real normal patient. The patient is facing you and slightly up, and by convention, the patient's left is on your right. Pictured here are two common vascular studies. Brain MR angiogram without contrast on the left, and the head CT angiogram with contrast on the right. Let's start with the posterior circulation. I'm going to need your help here, so anytime I pause, I want you to point out the vessel I'm talking about on the screen. Vertebrals are here. Pica must be here, since it comes off the vertebral artery. The two vertebrals join together to form the basilar here. The two major perforators of the basilar are Ica and SCA. They are faintly seen on the MRA, and I'm not seeing the Ica on the CTA. 
the basilar terminates into PCAs. Remember the top of the palm tree. Meanwhile, in the anterior circulation, the internal carotids split into anterior cerebral arteries and middle cerebral arteries. Correct. And now the neck vasculature. Same orientation as before. MRA of the neck with gadolinium contrast is on the left, and CTA of the neck with iodine-based contrast is on the right. Incidentally, you might have picked up on the fact that intracranial MRA does not need contrast, and neck MRA does. That's because intracranial vasculature is fixed inside the skull, but breathing and swallowing introduces motion artifacts in the neck vessels. There's also more tissue to go through in the neck to capture vessels. So if you don't use contrast for the neck MRA, you generally get a blurry mess. Okay, back to the vessels. Let's play the same game. Every time I call out a vessel name, point it out. Aortic arch gives rise to the brachiocephalic trunk on the right, which branches into the common carotid, and then internal carotid. On the patient's left, the common carotid arises directly from the aortic arch. Common carotid bifurcates into the external carotid with branches in the neck. And internal carotid. Posterior circulation originates from the subclavian arteries, which then give rise to the vertebrals. Easy, nothing to it. Now we're talking about non-invasive vascular imaging here, but the most detailed vessel study is the conventional angiogram. You might also see it being referred to as the digital subtraction angiogram, or DSA. The study is the gold standard of vessel imaging, but also unfortunately invasive. These images are obtained by injecting contrast from a catheter located inside the internal carotid artery. The patient's right side is imaged first, and then the left. MRA and CTA can offer snapshots in time. But in addition to an excellent spatial resolution, this study also has temporal resolution. It shows you how the blood flow transitions from the arteries into veins. So we briefly reviewed three imaging modalities, MR angiogram, CT angiogram, and conventional angiogram. MR angiogram tends to be safer because it doesn't require radiation or contrast. It may even be safe in pregnancy. MR angiogram can also be ordered with an MRI of the brain, making it more informative. But it's slow and tends to overestimate the degree of stenosis. MRA is excellent in non-emergent and outpatient settings. CTA, on the other hand, is very rapid, and it has slightly better spatial resolution, so potentially more accurate. It's well suited to emergency situations, such as stroke codes. But it involves radiation and iodine-based contrast. This contrast rarely causes acute kidney injury and anaphylaxis. So CTA is potentially less safe than MRA. And finally, conventional angiogram is the gold standard because of its improved temporal and spatial resolution, but it's more invasive and expensive. Nowadays, non-invasive vascular studies actually do a pretty good job in approximating cerebral angiogram results. You may notice that I'm omitting ultrasound technologies, like carotid duplex and transcranial Doppler. Those are excellent for screening and follow-up because they're cheap and provide real-time physiological data. But ultrasound sees a very limited portion of the vascular tree and is technologist-dependent, so its usefulness in the initial diagnosis of a vessel problem is somewhat limited. Now, on to the main event, vascular territories. For this last section of the talk, please refer to the color legend on the right. Anterior cerebral artery supplies the medial frontal lobe, highlighted here in yellow. So ACA territory infarctions cause contralateral leg weakness by damaging the medial primary motor cortex of the frontal lobe where leg fibers reside. Contralateral lower extremity sensory loss by damaging the medial primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe an unmotivated state called abulia, and enterograde amnesia by damaging the cingulate cortex, which is part of the memory circuit. Just picture in your mind a patient who appears more forgetful, withdrawn, slow to respond, 
and dragging a weak leg when walking. Middle cerebral artery territories in red are by far the largest in the brain. If your brain is about 1200 cubic centimeters, then about half is being supplied by the MCAs. MCA territory infarction may include contralateral hemiparesis from damage to the primary motor cortex and descending motor pathways. Internal capsule, for example, pictured here. Contralateral facial paresis, again from damage to cortical bulbar fibers. Contralateral gaze paresis, from damage to the frontal eye fields. Basically, if you infarct the left frontal lobe, you would not be able to look to the right, causing a right gaze paresis or left gaze deviation. Aphasia, with damage to dominant frontal and temporal lobes, where expressive and receptive language pathways reside. Contralateral hemisensory deficits, with damage to the primary sensory cortex and the parietal lobe and the ascending sensory pathways. Field cut, or homonymous hemianopia, with damage to both temporal and parietal optic radiations. And finally, neglect, with damage to the non-dominant parietal lobe. A patient with MCA occlusion does not necessarily have to have all these deficits. But if you know that aphasia is likely MCA territory, maybe that would prompt you to look for field cut and gaze paresis in an aphasic patient. A quick note, the head of caudate is supplied by a tiny branch of the ACA called the recurrent artery of Hubner. Don't worry about memorizing that name, but why is that important? Well, if you see a comma-shaped infarct like this, then both MCA and ACA territories were likely affected. Usually these situations happen when an embolus travels to the ICA terminus and transiently includes both ACA and MCA. Posterior cerebral artery supplies the inferior medial temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. But here's the trouble with the PCA. PCA supplies the thalamus. Thalami are the switchboards of the brain and receive and send projections to all the lobes and then some. So PCA strokes can sometimes mimic MCA strokes. Patients get contralateral hemisensory loss from damage to sensory nuclei in the posterior thalamus, contralateral heminopia from occipital lobe damage, rarely neglect with non-dominant thalamic damage, the non-dominant thalamus talks to the non-dominant parietal lobe, so it makes sense. Thalamic neglect is clinically indistinguishable from parietal lobe neglect, but improves more quickly. Transcortical aphasia, with dominant thalamic damage. I wasn't kidding about the thalamus talking to everything. The dominant thalamus talks to the frontal and temporal lobes. Transcortical aphasias are less severe than the classical Broca's and Wernicke's with intact repetition and global cognitive issues, like behavioral abnormalities, confusion, and even memory difficulties. To make things even more difficult, PCA is the terminal branch of the basilar, so it supplies the midbrain. Midbrain is brainstem. Oh no. He said brainstem. I'm beginning to hate this talk already. It's not that bad, honestly. Overlaid in blue are some sample strokes of the midbrain. Damaging the motor fibers in the cerebral peduncle causes contralateral hemiparesis. Contralateral ataxia can result from damage to the red nucleus, which is part of the cerebellar pathway. And damaged oculomotor nucleus causes ipsilateral CN3 palsy. You know, ptosis, medial rectus weakness, superior rectus weakness, that sort of thing. Thankfully, at least the superior cerebellar artery is easy. It supplies, wait for it, the anterior superior cerebellum. So infarctions here cause ipsilateral ataxia. The cerebellar fibers are damaged after double crossing. The basilar artery supplies mostly the pons and the anterior medulla. Damaging the anterior medial pons causes contralateral hemiparesis and facial paresis. Motor fibers are anterior in the pons. Intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, 
caused by interrupting the medial longitudinal fasciculus, the connection between pontine paramedian reticular formation, horizontal gaze center, and the oculomotor nucleus in the midbrain. Basically, when looking in a particular direction, one eye goes out, but the other one never follows, because it never gets the command. Spinothalamic tract damage causes contralateral hemisensory loss. No surprise there. Patients with damaged lateral pons and cerebellar peduncles will have contralateral ataxia, kind of like the contralateral ataxia of the red nucleus damage in the midbrain, not at all like the ipsilateral ataxia of the cerebellar strokes. Pontine paramedian reticular formation damage will cause gaze weakness. For example, if your right PPRF is damaged, you won't be able to look to the right. You'll have right gaze paresis or left gaze deviation. And finally, when 5th and 7th cranial nerve nuclei are damaged in the lateral pons, the patient will have lower motor neuron type facial paresis, the whole face involving the forehead and eye closure, and ipsilateral facial numbness. There's a lot going on in the pons, so I tried to illustrate possible strokes with green highlights. Let's review. Medial pontine strokes cause contralateral weakness and intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. And lateral pontine strokes cause everything else. Ipsilateral facial numbness and weakness, horizontal gaze paresis, and contralateral ataxia and hemisensory loss. Bottom line, if you see a patient with ataxic hemiparesis on one side, start looking for eye movement abnormalities, like gaze deviation to the side of the weakness or intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. So we've left the lateral pons, and now we're moving posterolaterally into the cerebellar peduncle and the anterior inferior cerebellum. This is the domain of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. There are a few perforators off the basilar artery. Ica just happens to be a big one, kind of like the SCA. So like SCA strokes, Ica strokes can cause ipsilateral ataxia. Ica strokes can also damage some of the lateral pons. Now, quick recall from the last slide. What's in the lateral pons? Right, fifth cranial nerve nucleus and descending sympathetics. So, ICA strokes can cause ipsilateral facial sensory loss and Horner syndrome. But, ICA has an interesting party trick. Strokes can cause hearing loss. What? Hearing pathways are bilateral in a CNS. It's impossible to cause hearing loss from a central lesion. Well, Ica gives rise to labyrinthine artery, which supplies the inner ear. Don't bother memorizing it, it's just a fun bit of trivia. Hearing loss with Ica strokes is incredibly rare. I'm a stroke neurologist and I've only seen it once in a decade. Brainstem. How are you feeling? Still triggered? Your emotional ordeal like this talk will be over as soon as we discuss the medulla. Here, in the lateral medulla, is where the action is. The lateral medulla and the posterior inferior cerebellum is supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is a branch of the vertebral artery. So, if pica is involved, you can bet that a lesion in the vertebral artery is likely responsible. The lateral medulla contains contralateral spinothalamic tract, Ipsilateral cerebellar pathways in the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the vestibular nuclei. Ipsilateral trigeminal nucleus. Ipsilateral sympathetics. Nucleus of solitary tract that controls special sensation like taste. And nucleus ambiguous, which donates motor fibers to cranial nerves 9 and 10. So to summarize, a lateral medullary lesion will cause contralateral hemisensory loss, ipsilateral ataxia, ipsilateral facial numbness, horners, taste loss, and dysarthrodysphagia. What's missing from this list? Weakness. Medial medulla is supplied by the basilar artery. People with lateral medullary stroke will be ataxic, numb, dysarthric, but not weak. Ooh, we are done. And now for a quick review, I'm going to show you MRI diffusion-weighted imaging examples of some major strokes. You're going to have to help me out with this. Pica strokes cause a taxic dysarthric patient with a droopy eyelid on the same side and hemisensory loss on the opposite side. 
they will also have difficulty swallowing. Ica strokes cause a patient to have ipsilateral ataxia and maybe some ipsilateral hearing loss. What happens when you knock out one of the basilar perforators and affect the anterior medial pons? That's right, contralateral weakness and maybe intranuclear ophthalmoplegia if the lesion reaches far enough dorsally. SCA strokes cause correct apsilateral ataxia. In clinical practice, it's very difficult to differentiate between ICA and SCA strokes on the basis of the exam alone. But who even cares? Both ICA and SCA are giant perforators off the basilar artery, so stroke in both of these territories will likely be caused by the same mechanisms and have the same treatments. BCA strokes will cause... Haha, <laughs> that's a trick question. It depends on whether the midbrain is involved or not. Most commonly, this type of stroke will just affect the occipital lobe in the thalamus. So, when you see a patient with a field cut, look for cognitive deficits. Carotid occlusion will cause a large stroke comprising of ACA and MCA territories. It's the only stroke that is pictured by a head CT here. Remind me, what does a patient with ACA stroke look like? Right, abulic, amnestic, and dragging a leg when walking. And what are the deficits of a patient presenting with a right MCA stroke like pictured here? Contralateral weakness of the face, body, and gaze. Field cut and neglect. Remember that MCA occlusion does not have to present as a complete MCA syndrome. When a division is occluded, like a second order branch, only half of the MCA will be affected. You get the idea. I guess in the end, you start thinking about the beginning. Our patient SE. So which one of these is a vascular territory of our patient's stroke? Remember he had disorientation, mild word-finding difficulties, paraphasic errors, and right homonymous hemianopia. Well, someone's been paying attention. It's an acute left PCA stroke, which involves the left inframedial temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the left thalamus. Looking at this patient's CTA, you can plainly see that his left posterior cerebral artery is occluded. But there's just one more thing. You have been awake, alert, and at least partially oriented during this talk, so you remember that PCA is posterior circulation. Posterior circulation is comprised of subclavians off the aorta on the left and brachiocephalic trunk on the right, and their vertebral artery branches that eventually join together to form the basilar artery. Is there another problem with this patient's posterior circulation that can explain the PCA occlusion? How about now? Oh. Yes, our 83-year-old man had an acute left posterior cerebral artery occlusion because of an artery-to-artery -artery embolism from a left vertebral artery origin plaque. This plaque actually caused severe stenosis. And that's all I have for now. I feel like I should end with my customary disclaimer that this is an oversimplification. It's a good beginner's guide with some intermediate stuff sprinkled in. Nevertheless, thank you for indulging me, and we'll talk again soon. Bye.